It says, say. it says record, right? Yeah. Oh. Today is today is uh, Saturday, July eighth, and the year of our Lord two thousand six, and we're in uh, Bronxville, New York, at Three Locust Lane. Okay, wonderful. Your lovely home. <laughs> in our cathedral ceiling living room. Yeah. <laughs> um, Tell me uh, your impressions and uh, your thoughts on law um, and society at large uh, in this country. Um, this country is, I guess, touted as uh, the most litigated country in the world. Tell me, tell me your impressions of, about uh, law and society at, uh, at large. And your experiences in it. Well, that, that that's a big question because although I graduated from law school with a doctor of law degree, and my son is a college graduate, if he wanted to go to law school, I would support him. However, I would not encourage him to go to law school. Today, the law is just another business, as far as I'm concerned. Um, there's a lot of uncalled for litigation in society today. People are constantly looking to the courts to resolve social and economic problems, and the courts seem to uh, encourage, aid, and abet some of this uh, litigation instead of disposing of it uh, promptly and unclogging the courts from many. Uh, uncalled for uh, pieces of litigation. Um, unfortunately, uh, as I look back on my career, especially in litigation, I find that uh, many of the judges that ostensibly are sitting in fairness to judge cases, that is, people's fortunes or lives in the case of a criminal case, are not people well trained. There is no training per se in America for judicial office, uh, almost all judicial office in America depends on politics and who you know. And uh, we don't necessarily get the best. Once in a while we do get some good jurists, but uh, my experience in many years of litigation uh, suggests that uh, you, you never know who you're appearing before. One noted litigator to me reflected, albeit facetiously, don't tell me what the facts are, tell me who the judge is. In other words, uh, it would depend on uh, what his disposition is, and not necessarily what the facts and the law are. So that, I, I don't mean to be too jaded in my view uh, of uh, litigation of the law, uh, but uh, uh, it's somewhat distressing to see what goes on and uh, uh, see how much uh, rule uh, regulation and law compounds uh, us today, especially out of Washington, um, much less to each of the states today. For example, if you look at the Internal Revenue Code, it's uh, pounds of material. And it's so complicated, you, you, you need professionals who sometimes can't figure out what it's all about. So that we, we are in America, uh, overly extended in regard to rules and regulations and laws, that um, it's confusing uh, and uh, sometimes contradictory to where we're going. Uh, many of our social problems are heaped on the court for decision. Uh, otherwise, uh, it's, I guess, a safety valve in that we have maintained a a fairly stable and free society um, in America with our court system, but uh, it, uh, it needs great improvement as far as I'm concerned. I, I, I would like to reflect on one experience when you talk to me about my uh, legal experience. At one time I was requested during the civil rights campaigns in the South to volunteer my services in the South 
and I believe that would be back in 1963, in that era, 1963, 1964. I was the first lawyer to go south, and I believe it was on the first page of the New York Times that my volunteering to go south on what was then called the voter registration drives of the uh, black campaign in the South, for example, in the Carolinas and especially in Mississippi. I was down in those areas uh, representing various uh, civil rights organizations and its members who were being prosecuted or arrested to working out accommodations for them with the local police and various entities in Mississippi especially working with the chiefs of police or the mayors of villages where demonstrations were being organized and uh, trying to work out solutions to avoid um, any problems. So uh, that I did that in, in the summers of 1963 and I believe in 1964. One other point that um, would be of some interest to you in the uh, Korean War, which I did mention earlier, which <laughs> my wife always reminds me about because it seems that story is of great interest to people, was during the transit of the uh, Korean refugees south from Hongnam to Busan, it was very cold and we had no food or water for the refugees. So the, at one point, uh, my captain saw a thin column of smoke coming up from the number three hole and uh, was very concerned about that because that was the, the hole where we had the uh, jet fuel. We still had 300 tons of jet fuel down in that hole. And uh, so when we went down below, we found that the, the refugees were building fires atop these um, um, jet fuel drums and they were trying to keep warm or to heat food and uh, uh, as you can appreciate jet fuel I think is made up mostly of kerosene which I am not a chemist but uh, I, I believe it was highly inflammable so it was with great trepidation that we who got the Koreans uh, who spoke no English and with whom we could speak no Korean to put the fires out uh, uh, to, uh, they, were, they were building atop these drums of jet fuel so uh, it, was, uh, it was humorous when we look back on it but it was fairly dangerous at the time very uh, dangerous one moment just I'll take the pause play soccer and so yes. forth so somebody had the vision uh, Not wonderful, so yeah. that, that we can mingle, yeah. which is uh, very necessary and, and a good idea. I have one frog leap, uh, leap question, like, you know, coming from the island to the island, just in between the question, uh, through conversation with you, I see a lot of humor uh, quite often. So where did the humor come from? Who was uh, talented in your family? And how did you, what the humor means in your life? Like, uh, because you're were very organized, you're on time, which probably maybe gave you some sort of order in life. But where, where did the humor come and what does the humor mean to you, like in, on a daily basis? Well, I, I enjoy people who have a good sense of humor because I, I think that's part of relating to other people in conversation and otherwise but I think perhaps it comes about from our culture and the way we were brought up as children in a household where we didn't have too many opportunities otherwise than perhaps to amuse ourselves because uh, I reflect back that during the days when we grew up during the 30s and 40s, we never were taken to a restaurant we didn't go on vacations because the economics of the time were such and you always wore your older brother's clothes, you see. You never threw anything away, you always fixed it. 
you always repaired it, you always saved it, mm -hmm. uh, etc. So that part of our lives were to effect our own amusement and entertainment. Uh, that we didn't have television. Uh, yes, we had a radio, but I remember it was a big battery that, and we had to string an, an antenna well out to the clothes pole to to have uh, radio entertainment, uh, etc. So that we had no uh, real opportunity to go to theaters and, and uh, to us. If my mother gave us a quarter to go to the movies, there was uh, a great excitement. And especially if she gave you another nickel, you could buy a candy bar when you went to the movies. So that it was a rare treat even to go to a movie. Uh, and for example, even today, my, my son is amazed at uh, the fact that I, uh, neither my wife nor I really drink um, Pepsi Cola or Coca Cola or, or drinks like that because when uh, we were growing up, if you were thirsty, your father would say, Go and get a good glass of water. If you're still thirsty, have another glass of water. You know, so that uh, we don't look back as having been deprived of anything. We had limited opportunities of travel and, and uh, entertainment so that m maybe. That encouraged you to develop more skills of conversation and communication with one another. Uh, we used to read a lot. Uh, in my case, uh, I would read a lot of history and, uh, and geography. I liked geography and uh, uh, military exploits. So that uh, where a sense of humor comes from, I, it's hard to describe. But uh, I always enjoy people who appreciate a good sense of humor. People without humor are very dull. They, they don't uh, appeal to me very much, uh, especially if I try to kid them and they don't really understand it and they, they take you literally. I, I really don't enjoy their company very much. They, they have no imagination. They can't expand out of the box, as we say today. Yeah. I see. I, it's, uh, I, I, I heard from you that uh, when you talk about Navy, you talk about ship, because it's an entity, it's, it's, it's a unit, it's like a, a like cell in our body, sort of. But uh, there is a deep uh, emotional well for you and, uh, and faith in people around you. When you speak about men around you, there is a bonding, an unspoken bonding in which you mentioned that. And that's, um, I know you said it already, but I would love to hear a little bit more about it. Um, uh, how does it relate that to the to the life that it's not on the ship. How do people, when they leave the ship, because you, you leave sort of a mother ship, you know, and, and, and all the um, interactions with the people and friends and bonding, and you come to, to, to ground where other rules sort of apply. How, how did, you did you make that transition to, to the... the... The element of aboard a ship it's a very strong element of unit cohesion. Everyone respects the job and the duties and responsibilities of each man aboard the ship. Everyone knows what he's supposed to do. And in case of the Navy or even aboard a merchant ship, when you were engaged in enemy action, uh, general quarters, you know exactly where to go and what to do. You were well trained well experienced, uh, and all of the drills, the fireboat drill, abandoned ship drill, uh, set condition x-ray, set condition zebra throughout the ship. These were codes to, to know what doors to close, how to secure the ship, and in case of storm, enemy fire, or going, entering into enemy waters, uh, you knew exactly what to do. And you depended on everyone else, so much so that uh, in civilian life, you come to realize that, yes, you have to be very selective, I guess, in answering your question, that you, the, the dependency that you would have had aboard ship is not extant in civilian life. Uh, when you're off a ship, the unit cohesion is not as tight and as formidable 
and as extent as it would have been aboard a ship. The trust and confidence you have in people has to be very carefully selected. The people whom you get to know who are reliable or trustworthy uh, are carefully chosen. So you know, um, in fact, one time, uh, I guess, my father reflected on someone and he used an expression which I have always remembered and he would never disparage anyone. In fact, he would never say anything awkward or disparaging of a person. At most, if he didn't necessarily like someone, he would say, oh, he has a lovely wife and a fine family. <laughs> uh, and if, uh, you would speak to him about the reliability of someone, he would could say, well, would you give him a letter to mail? Think about that. Would you give him a letter to mail? And you say, that's a good question. I probably would not. He may put it in his pocket. He may forget about it. The next time he wears that suit, maybe he finds it, etc. Uh, reliability uh, off the ship sometimes is more questionable. Not that it's 100% effective with the unit cohesion aboard a ship, but uh, you have to be more careful in choosing your colleagues and comrades uh, off a ship, because even ashore, you could depend on your shipmate. If we were out drinking or uh, ashore in any situation, you would be very protective of your shipmate. Yeah. He's, he's my shipmate. Yeah. He's my colleague. Yeah. He, brotherhood. he has endured the same exigencies that I have. He has been through this. We've just crossed the Atlantic. I made many transatlantic crossings in heavy storm and ice and uh, stormy conditions and fog where you couldn't even see the bow of the ship. And you realize that all of the men you're serving with have endured this and have exposed to this danger. And uh, at the time, you don't call it danger. It's an experience. And so, so the unit becomes one life. That's it. The, the cohesion of that aboard a ship. It's 24 hours a day. You are living, you're eating together, you're serving together. You're not going ashore, uh, except uh, sometimes you get to a port, but you could be at, at sea for weeks. Uh, and uh, you, you, you relate to one another, you, you, uh, you trade books, you, you, you're constantly uh, passing one another. You, you, you're, it's like a family, uh, and uh, that, that in truth is your family. Uh, of course, you pick and choose many closer comrades and colleagues and shipmates aboard a ship. Uh, you measure the man too, whether he's more reliable than another man, but still you know what his duty and function is, and you know he's going to carry it out, and especially to, to prevail in, in case of hardship, weather, enemy action or otherwise loading and unloading ships is can be dangerous at times too. Tell me about your relationship with uh, Peter Tomic. I mean, now that you have known personally, but in a way you know him personally, is that right? Well, to reflect back on my impression of Peter Tomic, must begin with our first association with a Croatian, and that was with uh, Juliana Velcic. And Juliana came to us through the recommendation of her niece, Loretta. And uh, it was at a time when uh, we were advertising, would you believe in the newspaper called the Irish Echo for a housekeeper because my wife who is of a strong Irish tradition thought it would be a good idea to advertise for a housekeeper in the Irish Echo. Uh, however, what we didn't know was that a, a lot of people would uh, who were searching for positions 
unknown to us, who were not necessarily Irish, would be uh, buying and looking through the Irish Echo for positions. So, apparently, Loretta, Juliana's niece, looked in the Irish Echo and saw our advertisement for a housekeeper. So, Juliana had just come to America, this is maybe 15, 16 years ago, and uh, she had studied English and uh, had uh, some professional background in Croatia, and uh, of course she was looking for a job in America, and Loretta, who spoke English, brought Juliana to the house here. This is 15, 16 years ago, maybe. And uh, my wife interviewed her, and at the time, both my wife and I were working full time. Alexander was going to the local school. Uh, he may have been eight or nine, ten years old at the time. Uh, so Juliana was employed by us as a housekeeper, and she lived with us. She, her room was here. She had a private room and private bed, and she did all of the housekeeping. She prepared all the meals. She kept the house for us. She uh, maintained the. Uh, uh, Alexander's schooling and uh, 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 making sure he did his homework, etc. Uh, so that we, we got to know a Croatian. And like typical Americans, we didn't know much about Croatia. We, we knew there was a place out there, and uh, we knew of Yugoslavia, and uh, we, we had a sense of the geography, but didn't have a, a full understanding. And it was only through Juliana, who would live with us as part of our family. She would eat our meals with us, she would join in our conversation, and all during the period of time, uh, later on, she said she would read the newspapers that I would leave, trying to uh, acquire more English, and read some of our books in the library, etc. So, and, and she partook of our table conversation. We had all of our meals, Juliana lived with us, ate with us and uh, uh, to a certain extent socialized with us when we would have guests here at the house. But uh, so uh, she opened our eyes in many ways to Croatia, Croatian people. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, she uh, showed us catalogs, for example, of Zvonimir Mohanovic's paintings and how proud she was of a uh, Croatian painter. Uh, when we need help uh, here in the maintenance of the house. She recommended uh, various Croatian uh, vendors and Croatian uh, um, specialists in uh, regard to woodwork and otherwise. So uh, she always used to speak to us and really taught us a lot about Croatia and uh, would always instill in us a desire to come to her country. You must come to my country, etc. Well, there did come a time when um, I uh, uh, together with my wife and son, decided we would make a visit to Croatia. We uh, got hold of uh, Dean. Uh, you must know Dean. Uh, and Dean uh, obtained for us, uh, uh, through an Austrian company, uh, a uh, charter for a sailboat that was provided for us at the island of Tress, where Juliana was born and where her family were located. And then he obtained the services of a, of a uh, Croatian um, sailor who knew all of the islands uh, from uh, Trest to Dubrovnik and back again. So we uh, uh, chartered this boat and together with uh, Loretta joined us for part of that trip. And uh, my wife, Joan, and Alexander, my son, we sailed from Tress, and uh, Juliana's family uh, brought down all of the homemade cheese that the family made, and her brother's wine, and so we uh, brought all these victuals aboard the ship, uh, the, the sailing boat, and we set sail. But before we engaged in our trip to Croatia, I was talking to friends of mine here in the Navy, and it was in this room, and I spoke of an article I had read in the Navy Times, which is a commercial publication, not published by the Navy, but 
And it noted in a very small article about this medal of honor that had been awarded to a Peter Tomich, but had never been presented to a next of kin. And he was from Croatia, as they called it, uh, or Yugoslavia. And uh, I casually mentioned it to friends of mine from the Navy, but who knew we were going to Croatia. And they said to me, well, gee, while you're over there, why don't you look into this? Uh, because the Navy had not done much. They had never exhausted the uh, investigation to identify anyone. And so we all spoke about this here with Juliana, and um, I spoke to my Navy friends. And at some point, whether it was through Juliana, we, we contacted Krisnik, and maybe it was through our friend Dean. Uh, in any event, Krisnik came up. I remember we had a nice dinner with Krisnik here, and this would have been 1997 before we left. We left in August 1997 for our trip to Croatia, and Krisnik spoke to us about Peter Tomic because obviously this was something many Croatians knew about, but the medal was still being displayed behind glass at the museums and otherwise, and not much was being done by the Navy about it. But Krisnik knew that Adam Eterovich of the Croatian Genealogical Society in San Carlos, California, had done some research. Adam Eterovich forwarded to me copies of documents that showed the the family name was Herzeg, and uh, some documentation he had obtained through the Franciscan monastery. And, uh, and Christink knew a lot of the background as well. But all of this was provided to me. And I tried to get as much information as I could from the Navy before we left. And it was sort of exciting to me and, and uh, an endeavor that we could accomplish while we're over there because by this time our impression of the Croatian people was very high. We had met a lot of Croatian people through uh, Juliana who had come and helped us and done many things for us. We were very impressed with Juliana, her uh, work ethic, her unquestioned integrity, and her Christian spirit, and uh, uh, when any of our friends came here, we would meet them, and they all impressed us as good people, many from good families, and we appreciated their Christian faith in action, etc. So we were much imbued about this issue uh, because of that background and our impression of the Korean pe uh, of the Croatian people. Now, uh, we had this material, we were sailing south, we, we got to Split, and um, we had previously met um, Zvonimir Mahanovich, uh, maybe in 1992, is it possible? I'm not sure exactly when. When he came in the painting here in our living room, he brought over himself. Uh, we had a great dinner here in our dining room, and uh, he physically brought the painting from Croatia. And uh, so we were very impressed with that, the talent and the, the goodness of Croatian people. But when we got to uh, Split, um, we met Zvonimir Mahanovic. We also met Krisnik's daughter, who was there at the time. She was studying. And uh, we met a number of other Croatian people. It was at the, uh, if you're familiar with the marina, right there in Split. Uh, so we tied up at that marina, and we were having dinner at the marina restaurant. And uh, uh, Zvanko, as he, we were calling him at that time, said, we've got to do something about this. 
So he got in touch with the newspaper, and uh, they came and they had uh, many articles uh, written about this quest for the next of kin and the family, and uh, he organized uh, uh, transportation and all the logistics uh, with the newspaper, and uh, I think we had two cars, and we proceeded north. This would have been 1997 from Split, that road all the way up to the uh, border of Bosnia. And we crossed over, and at that time the Spanish uh, army was occupying that section of Bosnia. And I, I think <coughs> we were able to cross the border with no problem, with maybe a carton or two of cigarettes to the... The Spanish. <laughs> there was no, there was no problem getting over and into the border, and we first drove up to uh, Major Gorge, and uh, uh, we spoke uh, to uh, one of the priests who, uh, um, uh, Mom uh, Zvanimir had called ahead of time, and uh, of course we visited the church where the apparition had occurred, and we said our prayers there at uh, Major Gorge. And uh, uh, I, I can't remember the priest's name. It began with a little Latic or something like that. But his nickname was Mustache. He was as tall as you, but he had a big mustache. And uh, he was Franciscan. And uh, he was very cooperative, spoke English. And he called down. He said, well, where you have to go is to the, would, would be the parish, the diocesan parish, with whom much? Humach, H-U-M-A-C-H, I think. And so he called ahead, and we drove from Major Gorgia down to the uh, monastery, the Franciscan monastery, and they were all prepared. The, the, the prior of the abbey uh, was prepared to meet with us because all of these connections were made, all the network was accomplished. We got in. All of the books, records, and documents were all made available to us. And uh, the dust was flying off these volumes from 1893 and, and everything else. And uh, everyone was pretty excited about it. And they showed us exactly where Peter Herzig had been uh, christened and the date he was brought from his godparents of the village up. And uh, there was a little difference in the date of his birth uh, from the Navy records, maybe one or two weeks. Uh, we uncovered that, and we also uncovered the fact that he had been married. Uh, we believe he was married like in 1911 or so, and in all probability from the story we heard, it was like an arranged marriage. She may have been a year or two older than him, and she was from a nearby village, and we, we were able to make copies of all the records that confirmed all of the evidence that uh, Iterovich, had provided to us, so everything was confirmed. Thence, uh, they arranged for us to go to Prologue, which was the village where uh, Peter Tomich was born. And uh, we, we got to the village, and we met the entire family. The village was all excited. Maybe there was approximately 400 people in the village, but it was, you know, your typical Balkan village with that little road down the middle with all the little houses and the agricultural fields surrounding the village and uh, all of these little old houses. They brought us to the house where Peter Tomich was born. They said this is where he was born. This Ivan was his cousin as he described him in his Navy papers as his beneficiary, had returned to what was then Yugoslavia in the 1920s. And uh, he had died, I believe, in 1948. But his son was there when we met. His son was then about 75 years old. And his son introduced us, that is Ivan's son, Drago, introduced us to his son, uh, Stretchko. And uh, Stretchko was a uh, lieutenant colonel of the Croatian army. And then uh, we took photographs and uh, we displayed all of the records and everyone was pretty excited. We had the records, we had the proof 
we had the identity, we met everyone, we had photographs, we had, uh, came to the village. At the Franciscan monastery, I inquired as to whether any from the, anyone from the Department of Defense or the United States Navy had ever been there, looked at any record. They said, no, no, no one had ever come. No one checked on anything. In the village, we asked, did anyone from the Navy ever come here? Did a, a naval attaché from Zagreb, did anyone from the uh, embassy ever come here to interview, talk to, identify, or check on any uh, relative? They said, absolutely not. No one, no one. They were all aware that there was some award given to Peter. Uh, in fact, they had uh, gotten some certificate uh, from a, a court establishing the right to the award, uh, but uh, it was from a lower court and uh, uh, the, I, I have a copy of that amongst my documents. But in any event, I was all excited, so was my wife and Alexander, and at all times Juliana was with us. Uh, Loretta had already left the boat and had gone back because she didn't have much time off from work. And uh, we uh, were able to put it all together with the documentation, my research, etc., and presented it to the Navy. Which year was that? The 1997, when we came back. And uh, I made my report because I had received orders from the New York Naval Militia to undertake this. And my commander was uh, Rear Admiral Robert A. Rosen, who was very enthused and very um, supportive of this effort. Because he too could see, in, in the current vocabulary, he got it. He understood that this medal should be presented to the next of kin. It should not be on a display cabinet <laughs> in some museum. This was the only Navy Medal of Honor never presented to a next of kin. And we were astonished over that. And uh, we found after submitting all of the material to the Navy, that the Navy chose not to do anything about it. They said, oh, there's too many discrepancies here. His birth date is different from what we have in our records. This is in his real name. His name was Tonich, when he enlisted in the Navy, later on the name became Tomich. Uh, and I'm trying to show that the, uh, his real name was Herzig, but there were so many Herzigs in the village that they used clan names or nicknames of Tonich. Uh, and of course, Tonich is spelled T-O-N-I-C with that accent over the C. And then he enlisted in the Navy under Tonich, T-O-N-I-C-H. And then later on, the Navy started spelling it Tomich, T-O-M-I-C-H. And then later on, he starts signing his name Tomich, T-O-M-I-C-H. So the Navy was establishing all of these discrepancies. And the birth date was wrong. They had no evidence that he had been married. He'd always said he was not married. And I uncovered the fact he had been married. And then they were just very obstinate and stonewalled every effort I made. And I made every inquiry, what else do you need, what do you want? Oh, if you want to, you can keep sending material to us and we will decide whether it's sufficient to, to uh, proceed with any uh, presentation of the medal. I uh, inquired as to whether the, the board could review this and uh, they said, oh, we will send it to the board first, we will get an opinion from the Judge Advocate General and I said, well, uh, who will you assign this to? I would like to come to Washington and I will meet with the lawyer and uh, to confer with him and uh, answer all questions. They, oh no, there's no need for that. I said, well then, I would like to appear before your board if you're going to have a hearing or presentation. There's no need for that. We, we don't need you to come here. I said, well, I tell you what, why don't you uh, establish a connection with the uh, defense attaché or the military attaché, the naval attaché from Zagreb, and ask him to go. I said, it's a day trip. I said, this is not a big country. He can travel to, to uh, uh, Humach and, uh, and to Prologue. I said, and verify himself with, uh, with all of the records and meet the family. I said, because your records show that he is from Prologue and he was born there in 1893 and you can meet him. Oh no, we have no duty or responsibility to do that. There's no need for that. 
I said, I will go over at my own expense. I said to Zagreb, I will accompany uh, any representative from the Navy. I will take him there uh, and, uh, and uh, we will review everything together and I will show him the family and I will speak to the Abbey. And uh, oh, no, no, absolutely not. We have no duty or responsibility to investigate this. We have no resources to uh, find any uh, uh, next of kin from anyone at any time, etc. They were just stonewalling and uh, up, uh, with great obfuscation of everything I was presenting to them. And finally, I brought a law. And these are, this is like a committee? Uh, or the, 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 the Department of the Navy, uh, the Awards and Decorations uh, Bureau, together with uh, the Judge Advocate General giving them legal advice, saying, oh, there's too many discrepancies. We're the lawyers here. There's too many discrepancies. There's, there's not enough here. Until there's sufficient evidence, you should maintain custody of this medal. And besides, then they started arguing. It had already been presented. So we can't present it again. They said, when was it presented? They said, oh, it's presented to the ship, USS Tomich, a DE, destroyer escort. So it was placed on the ship when the ship was commissioned. They put it in a glass cabinet on the ship in a frame. And they said, therefore, it was presented. So you can't present a medal twice. I said, this is ridiculous. How do you present it to a ship? Right. <laughs> and then it was displayed in Salt Lake City because the governor of Utah wanted to, to display the medal. So then they made him an honorary, that is Peter Tomich, an honorary citizen of the state of Utah, etc. And then it got traveled around. I think it was a duplicate or a replica in, uh, in Newport at the senior uh, enlisted academy. And there's also a propulsion academy in the uh, school in, in the Great Lakes Training Center also. And I think it may, or a replica or a duplicate have been out there too. And then it was in a museum down in Washington, a Navy museum. And they kept moving it around and they told me that this is good and sufficient. We named the ship after him. We have buildings named after him. We have his medal in a, in a, in a glass cabinet. And, uh, we are giving him great honor and prestige. And uh, uh, We don't find whatever you're doing to be of any value. It's not sufficient, etc. So then I brought a lawsuit. I filed a federal action. And asking the court, the federal court, to uh, decide that this was a medal that should be presented. And they said I had no standing, even though I had been appointed the administrator of his estate. I appealed it to the Court of Appeals. Again, they rubber-stamped and approved the lower court and said I had no standing to bring the action. And that was the end of it. I think that was in the year maybe 2003, three or four years ago. And therefore, it was a dead issue. There was nothing more. I exhausted everything. I supplied the Navy with all of the documentation, legal argument. I submitted a, a report that could be like a quarter to a half inch thick with all sorts of exhibits and legal points and legal arguments. And they would absolutely refuse to do anything, um, telling me that in one letter they said, Oh, we can't do much more for your client. So the aspersion was that this was a client of mine, that there was some commercial uh, interest in this. And I said, we are absolving any claim for money or, you know, benefits in any way whatsoever. All we're interested in is seeing that the medal presented, be presented to the next of kin. Well, about a year ago, I got a call, telephone call. This issue now was dead for a number of years. And uh, someone called me from the Department of Defense at the Pentagon. Oh, Mr. Lunny, we're very interested in the uh, uh, Medal of Honor for Peter Tomich. And we have reviewed the file and saw all of your work. And uh, we are interested in making a presentation. I said, well, listen, please, I've exhausted all my effort and time and energy, personal expense. I said, please, I don't care to go through this drill all over again. I said, uh, I uh, really am very disappointed about the way the government handled this. 
especially the Navy, and refusing to do anything at all about it. And he interrupted me. He said, well, uh, Mr. Lani, he said, please understand something. He said, that's all behind us. Right now, we have a direction from the Secretary of Navy that this is going to be accomplished, and it will be presented to Stretchko Herzog Tonich. I said, well, why is this coming about? Well, you, 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 you didn't receive any, or at least I didn't receive any satisfactory response uh, to that question. And even to this day, I'm not sure what triggered this, because I must sit here and tell you that nothing more was done other than a total reliance, 100% on everything I submitted to the Navy, because I have since found out that the Navy sent no one to the Franciscan Monastery, no one went to Prologue, no one interviewed any one of the family, etc. All they did was take my uh, report and recommendation and decided that they were going ahead with the presentation. And indeed, they uh, said they had to vet the background of Stretchko to make sure that uh, Stretchko was what we we call clean. See, because uh, you you know the politics of the the homeland war and um, the various operations <laughs> and claims of cleansing and, and other problems that ensued as a result of the war. And uh, I think th this is my own conjecture. They wanted to make sure that uh, <laughs> Stretchko was a good guy and uh, came from a good family and that, that this was not going to cause any embarrassment. These are my own uh, reflections and conjecture. Well, th this took maybe 10, 11, 12 months, I don't know, because the first call I got was last May or June 2005, and as we all know, it was finally accomplished here in May 2006. It was first to be presented by the Vice President of the United States, who was going to go on his visit to um, Dubrovnik, Dubrovnik uh, on May 6th or May 8th, I forget the date, but then that all fell apart. We all had our reservations and airline tickets and hotels, <laughs> that, that was all canceled. They said, oh no, the Vice President went home. And uh, then the next thing we know was they decided it would be uh, yeah. presented on May 18th uh, aboard the carrier USS Enterprise, the nuclear carrier CVN-65, etc. And so, as you know, the end of the story it was accomplished and the presentation was made. Ordinarily, a Medal of Honor is presented by the President of the United States in the Rose Garden at the White House, even to the living recipient or if it was the next of kin. This is one of the first times I've ever heard of a Medal of Honor being presented outside of the United States. And it was the only Medal of Honor, of course, that had never been presented to a next of kin. And uh, so we were very enthused and happy that we accomplished the mission. The Navy sent a carrier to the split. It was a beautiful day. And the mission was accomplished and the medal was presented to the family and received by Stretchko Herzig, who was a great hero in the Homeland War. And thus uh, the story was completed by presenting a medal of honor of a naval hero to a lieutenant colonel of the Croatian army who was a hero in the homeland war. So the uh, genetic pool of that family was proven <laughs> because of this great tradition yeah. by a good family in a good Croatian family. We were delighted because it served two purposes, recognizing a great naval hero and also establishing warmer and stronger relations between two countries. How does the faith um, reflect in your life? And how much did the faith help you to go through these rejections? Because this is uh, difficult to be rejected on, on, on in federal court, and you know you're right. I always felt I was doing the right thing. I always felt we had identified the right family and the right recipient. And uh, I imagine that as you go through life, 
you know that life is filled with successes, detours, and sometimes failure, and you just go on. You have strength of character. You know that not all your wishes, desires, hopes are fulfilled. You hope for the best, you pray. Your Christian faith in action, I imagine, teaches us that when God closes one door, he opens another. So, prayer is always good. Whether or not prayer is always answered is always a question. But still, your faith in yourself, because of your Christian doctrine and your family and your close friends, sustains you. And you, you, you go about life knowing that you're doing the right thing and uh, you try your best. And um, in this case, there was never a question in my mind that we were doing a good thing and a right thing for good people. And um, we were just delighted because of our affection for Croatia, the Croatian people and to establish a warmer connection between our two countries. Because to us, the Croatian people, when they come to America, they come here to work, to build families, and to contribute to America. And uh, thus, uh, to us, it was a, a great opportunity as an American myself to uh, make my contribution to that um, association. I know it's difficult to ask uh, things to summarize. Most of your life, probably through osmosis, you transfer your knowledge or faith or integrity to your son and to your friends around you. But uh, do you have some couple of principles that you you repeat yourself or repeat your son that your son is tell, uh, telling you don't don't tell me that again? What what is it that you really believe? Like what are your main beliefs? Well, it's, it's hard to say, because um, I don't believe that too many people listen to me. Or perhaps uh, you try in Christian faith to lead by example. And I think that's one of the doctrines of the church and in our Christian faith. Um, try to maintain as best you can a good life with great faith in a hereafter and trust that as you go through life you're treating people fairly and equitably. I'm not sure I ever sat down with my son Alexander to give him any precepts or guidelines or characteristics other than knowing that my wife and I, I trust, are setting good example. To me, that's more important than, than teaching. He has the teaching of the good, holy Roman Catholic Church uh, because he has studied for his sacraments of Holy Communion and uh, Confirmation. Thus, He's well grounded in our faith. And I think, in answer to your question, it's leadership by example. And indeed, isn't it ironic that that is the motto of the Senior Enlisted Academy in uh, Newport, which was erected in honor of Peter Tomich. And I think, in talking to the survivors of the um, Utah, Hundreds of men were saved because of Peter Tomich's sacrifice. And they all spoke of his leadership. And that leadership was not sitting men down and teaching them leadership or making them read. I'm not sure whether Peter Tomich was much of a reader, but he set good example of hard work, industry, and reliability. So that this is what I think makes the world tick makes the world go around is to reflect on 
leadership by example. And I, I'm not sure that answers your question, but that that's why I come out. I have uh, one question for you, which is all related to to what you have said, uh, but uh, I, I guess every what you just said can be summed up that your relation relationship to Peter Tomich in a way is uh, has all the attributes of what you believe in self-sacrifice lead by example um, and his unit cohesion his men were his family when I spoke to some of the survivors they said he would really speak of his family or his homeland. Many of them didn't even know that he was Croatian. They said he was European. He, he spoke with an accent, etc. But they, they all knew that they were part of, of his family, if you use that word loosely, etc. And that's what caused him to go down below to make sure his men were safe and to secure those boilers. Plus, the fact that he was a sailor and devoted his life to, the, to his ship and his men was very important to me. And only years later did I realize he is still entombed. And one, one man said to me, he said, Peter Tomich is still on watch. Peter Tomich is still on duty. So, in, in a certain sense, it turns out that you and Peter Tomic uh, are one and the same. Well, not really, because I would I admire a man like himself, but like all of us, you never know whether you would be willing to sacrifice your life the way he did. And perhaps he was hopeful he would get out too, but. He was unable to because that ship was struck by a second torpedo. The first one was 8.01 in the morning. The second one was about 8.10, 10 minutes later. And by 8.12, the entire ship had capsized within 12 minutes of the first torpedo. So by 12 minutes after 8, that ship had been totally capsized and trapping 58 men, including Peter Tomich. And to this day, that hulk was dragged across Pearl Harbor into a far corner and today very few people know about the USS Utah and only in 1972 did they even get around to putting a plaque up and a flag to recognize that this is the tomb of 58 men. You must understand that one man was rescued and the tapping when the ship capsized, one man was able to be rescued. He kept tapping on the overturned hull. They were able to get an acetylene torch and open it up to get that one man out. But the other f 58 men are still there. We thank you very much. Uh, only recently did I read that some years ago, one of the survivors of the USS Utah requested that his ashes be entombed in the Utah with his, with his shipmates. And they placed those ashes down into the ship. Navy divers took the ashes in the urn and placed them down into the ship because it's really he, long. he wanted to be with his shipmates. God, the rest of the song. They said he, like all sailors, 
he enjoyed a good drink. And uh, I met one survivor down in Florida, and he said, sure. He said, uh, Peter would, uh, you know, get out there and drink a good quantity before he could get back to the ship. And one time he thinks he remembers Peter missed the ship, and they had to, you know, pick him up later on, and, or he came back to the ship, etc. But he was what you would call a man's man. He worked hard, maybe he drank hard, uh, and he, he was just a hard worker. And uh, you, you uh, are Croatian, and you know that, that type of Croatian. We know in America, the, the, the people that came out of Croatia became the miners in our coal fields, in mining and lead out in Colorado. I, I remember going skiing in Colorado and seeing Croatian uh, the, the centers. Yeah. yeah, but uh, also uh, where, where they would, centers, yes. yeah, would uh, have a club, yeah, a Croatian yeah. club thing, but these are long gone now, etc. I think there's still one there. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, but still, they, they didn't come out to go on welfare, they came out no. to work hard, earn a, a living, marry, raise families, pay their taxes, go to church, and uh, uh, enjoy America. They were just good people that made great contributions. So that inspired my wife and my son and I to do what we could to honor a, a, a true American naval hero, a Croatian immigrant who uh, deserved great recognition. And uh, it was just a great day in Croatia, as you know, when Stretchko received that uh, medal and for his family. And uh, it was a great day for Croatia. Yes, it was. That actually just finished. Yeah. It's zero minutes. So.